discouraged Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long? Good morning, and welcome to the 2021 Military District of Washington, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Birthday Observance. I am Bruce Rothwell, the Program Manager for the MDW Military Equal Opportunity Program. On behalf of Major General Jones, the Commander, Joint Task Force, National Cavalry Region, and U.S. Army Military District of Washington, I welcome you to our virtual observance to pay honor and tribute to the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In 1994, Congress passed the King Holiday and Service Act, designated the Martin Luther King Jr. Federal Holiday as a National Day of Service and charged the Corporation for National and Community Service with leading these efforts. Taking place each year on the third Monday in January, the Martin Luther King Day of Service is the only federal holiday observed as a National Day of Service, a day on, not a day off. The Martin Luther King Day of Service is a part of United We Serve, the President's National Call to Service Initiative, it calls for Americans from all walks of life to work together to provide solutions to our most pressing national problems. The MLK Day of Service empowers individuals, strengthens communities, bridges barriers, creates solutions to social problems, and moves us closer to Dr. Martin King's vision of, of a beloved community. In a musical hairspray, Winton Scott Michael and Shaman Mark wrote that, There's a road we must travel. There's a promise we must make, but the riches will be plenty, worth the risk and the chances we take. There's a dream in the future. There's a struggle that we have yet to win, and there's pride in our heart because I know where I'm going. Yes, I do, and I know where I've been. These words ring true today, that there is still work to do and sacrifice to make, but the riches will be plenty and the risk is worth the take. Please listen as Sergeant Dorn from the United States Army Field Band plays tribute to Dr. King as she sings, I know where I've been. Is 
as black as my skin There's a light burning bright Showing me the way Cause I know where I've been There's a cry in the distance It's a voice comes from deep within there's a cry asking why i pray the answers up ahead cause i know where i've been there's a road we've been traveling lost so many will be plenty worth the price the price we had to pay there's a dream in the future there's a struggle that we have yet to win and this pride in my heart There's a struggle that we have yet to win, yeah. Use that pride in our hearts to lift us up till tomorrow. Cause just to sit still would be a sin, yeah. Lord, I Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was more than just a dreamer. And to focus solely on the latter half of one speech delivered on one day in his 13-year public ministry misses the true substance and brilliance of the man. It is my honor to speak today to what I call the other 1%, those who have made the decision and personal sacrifice to wear or have worn our nation's uniform. We are approximately 1% of our nation's population. I celebrate, honor, and salute you for your service. I appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts on this celebration of Dr. King's birthday. Had he lived, he would have been 92 years old last week. But as a patriot who loved, served, and challenged his country in the streets, in the courthouse, and in the court of public opinion, he truly gave the last full measure of devotion for our nation. Dr. King was a patriot who understood that the true definition of patriotism was not to go along with whatever our government and society were doing or what was considered normal or customary at the time. Instead, he understood that the greatest form of patriotism is dissent. At the conclusion of his first inaugural address, President Abraham Lincoln said, Quote, I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet swell with the chorus of the Union, 
when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. Lincoln hoped that once the din of war had died down, that we as a nation would once again aspire to the better angels of our nature. Dr. King's firm hope for our country was that she would aspire to honor and live out, as he said, quote, the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, all people, are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And so Dr. King chose to hold our nation accountable to honor and uphold those words, but more than just words, that covenant written in ink in the 1700s and secured by blood ever since. According to our Constitution, that document and guiding principle to which we all pledge our allegiance when we take our oath of office to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. Our mission as the United States of America, according to our Constitution, is to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, to promote the general welfare. That means not just your welfare or my welfare, but for Lottie, Dottie, and everybody. And to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. My friends, we always want to secure and be secure that the things we say and do today honor those constitutional principles so that we leave a legacy that is worthy of our children. Unless the things we say and do now can be a blessing to our unborn descendants, what is the point? I would submit that sometimes pride gets in the way. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, the Bible says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. To be haughty means to be arrogantly superior and disdainful. The thing about haughtiness is that it is often founded on self-delusion. In other words, how we see ourselves may not be who or how we actually are. Let me come up on your front porch for a minute to say that any one iteration of God's creation is superior to or better than any other is arrogant, deluded, and false. As human beings, we take false pride in feeling we are intrinsically better than in someone else, often because of economic status, our education, or because of skin color please know that the skin you're in is a reflection of a very small part of your genetic makeup. The Human Genome Project knowledgeably and scientifically informed us that we human beings are all 99.9% .9 plus the same at the genetic level. That means the things that determine our diversity, especially our diversity visible to the eyes, is less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of our DNA. If this were a math problem, the question would be, which do you think is more important and relevant, the 99 or the one? I pause to note here that everyone within the sound of my voice is family. Genetically, you are cousins with every other person on the earth. They may not be see you at the family reunion cousins, but geneticists tell us that every person on this planet is at most 30th cousins with every other person on this planet. Remember when we all found out that President Obama and Vice President Cheney were cousins? Who could be more obviously 
dif distant and different from each other, and yet they're kin. We are all no more than 30th cousins on this planet. And we have to learn to look past this 1 64th of an inch covering of skin. Each of us is made in the image and likeness of God who loves us all and has no favorites. Let me say it again. For anyone to assert or believe that they are superior to anyone else isn't just a lie. It's a damn lie. Any allegation of supremacy is fictionalism. So so-called white supremacy is white fictionalism. So-called black superiority is black fictionalism. Any kind of alleged superiority of one human being over another is fiction. But when we choose to abide in fantasy land and cling to the one, we ignore the promise of the 99. In the context of my career field, the pastor or shepherd is not superior to his or her flock. We serve in different roles and capacities, but as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. We all have gifts and we all have an assignment or assignments to fulfill while traveling through this journey called life. And we can accomplish these assignments best when we work supportively together. Let me meddle a little bit more. In the context of the military, just because someone has more rank than you do doesn't make them better than you are. It just means that they probably got there first and have been here longer. But the rank on your sleeve or your collar doesn't make you intrinsically better than anybody else. Y'all don't have to invite me back, but I'm going to say it while I'm talking to you now. I learned early in my military career that if I wanted to have a successful career, I needed to appreciate and value the wisdom, perspectives, and insights of enlisted leadership. My point, don't ever let anyone devalue you because of the color of your skin or your family uh, of origin or community of origin. God made you just the way he wanted you to be. And don't ever let anyone devalue you because of your rank, your age, I'm sorry, your rank, or the number of letters that may be behind their name. Only a fool could believe that just because they might be better at something than you are makes them better than you. I'm just saying God has no favorites. There's a story about a Confederate general, Robert E. Lee, kneeling at the altar to pray. And while he was praying, an enslaved, stolen African kneels at the altar to pray as well. Later on, after he had gotten up, one of his uh, acquaintances, one of his associates, came to the general and asked him, what were you doing kneeling at the altar next to that Negro? And General Lee a slave-owning senior general for the Confederacy had the good sense to know and say, all ground is level at the foot of the cross. All ground is level at the foot of the cross. No exceptions. Let me cut across, across the field and bring this home. Some of the greatest challenges we are facing right now as a nation reflects ongoing conflicts between human beings often focus on our 1% rather than our 99%. Reverend Dr. King made this statement. We must learn to live together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. A fool is defined as one who is deficient in judgment, sense, or understanding. A fool is one who acts unwisely. We are in great danger as a nation that if we continue to allow our national affairs and policy decisions to be dictated by or oriented around people who are engaging in foolish behavior. 
please understand that a disunited States of America is as vulnerable to the same rot from within and disintegration that led to the destruction and disappearance of other former great empires. We must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. In a speech to the AFL-CIO Labor Convention in December of 1961, Dr. King said, quote, I look forward confidently to the day when all who work for a living will be one with no thought of their separateness as Negroes, Jews, Italians, or any other distinctions. This will be the day when we bring into full realization the American dream, a dream yet unfulfilled, a dream of equality of opportunity, of privilege and property widely distributed, a dream of land where men will not take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few, a dream of a land where men will not argue that the color of a man's skin determines the content of his character, a dream of a nation where all our gifts and resources are held not for ourselves alone, but as instruments of service for the rest of humanity, the dream of a country where every man will respect the dignity and worth of the human personality, that is the dream. As you just heard in his comments to the AFL-CIO in 1961, the dream we heard Dr. King pronounce so eloquently on August 28, 1963, was a concept he had developed over several years. But it was much more than just a dream. It was a prescription for our survival as a nation. And we disregard it at our own peril. In a speech delivered exactly one year before his assassination on April 4th, 1967, at Riverside Church in New York, Reverend King began his remarks by observing that, quote, a time comes when silence is betrayal. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. I close with this. Many of you have never heard this portion of the speech he delivered on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial that day. In many ways, he could have delivered this speech just a day or two ago, and it would be just as timely. The speech was essentially two speeches, and at a certain point, you can hear singer Mahalia Jackson in the background shout out, tell him about the dream, Martin, tell him about the dream. Prior to that familiar portion of the speech, Dr. King began his prepared remarks. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to the end, to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languishing in the corners of American society and finds himself an exile in his own land. So we have come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. 
This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check. A check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we have come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. And he went on to say that the marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. They have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. And you've heard the rest, but I bet a lot of you had not heard what he said before he got to the dream. Family, the mission is still largely the same today, but even more urgent. We can no longer accept the status quo as being normal, reasonable, decent, acceptable, or moral. The coronavirus pandemic has exposed in very stark terms that while some in our nation are comfortable and may have even enriched themselves in this season of great trial, others must stand in long lines to receive enough food to survive. We can no longer assume people receive adequate compensation for their labor, a living wage, or have enough food to eat. We cannot assume that everyone who needs quality health care can afford access to it. We cannot act as if the housing insecurity the pandemic has exposed is new or that it isn't a real thing. This pandemic has re-exposed the giant fissures in our country or, or materialism and racism. But more than just that, they have created an opportunity for us to be better and to do better and be as concerned about our fellow countrymen and women and their families as we are about our own. Let me say that again so you don't miss it. We cannot act as if the housing insecurity the pandemic has exposed is new or isn't a real thing. 
The pandemic has re-exposed these fissures in our country of materialism and racism. But more than that, they've created an opportunity for us to do better and be better. It is my hope that we, the people, will come together, work together, and help to fashion a nation that lives up to her pronouncements, as Dr. King put it. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. The time for being excited about a dream is over. We must now hold, on, hold our nation and each other accountable to do the greatest good for the greatest number and to truly aspire and pursue the better angels of our nature. Thank you for your time and attention. And it is my prayer that these words become reality in our military, in our nation, and in our world. Amen, and God bless you. I see because I'm happy. Just me.